This is one of a series of conferences over the years, an exploration of our relational understanding of the world with each other and uh, with more than human. Um, and indeed how these have their roots deep, deep into the into metaphor that lies at the heart of our biology. The metaphor is absolutely basic to cre human creativity, whether in the sciences or the arts. When we ask where that comes from, well, nothing comes from nothing. It's an evolution uh, of, you know, kind of greater semiotic complexity, I would say, from what has gone before. And the things that enable us to have articulate language and a kind of well-developed sense of metaphor in language exist already in nature. In the sea, uh, you can see the tiniest ripple, which sits on top of the wave, which sits on top of tide. The same shapes and eddies, you can see those in structures like art practices as well. If you're involved in a, a, a piece of work over an extended period of time, you may have things going on in the background that you, you know, you're working away, you're not really focusing on it. And you put the work aside and then maybe weeks, maybe years later, pick it up and you touch it and suddenly what was going on at the time when you last worked on that project returns to you and it returns to you not because you've thought about it but because of some haptic encoding of, of the environmental influences that were absorbed into the making. I picked that pebble up, somehow between me, the pebble, time of day, the beach I'm on, whatever's going on, a thought comes into me. And that thought that was kind of generated by that convergence, that meeting of all those different things, changed the direction of my life. So I called it an echo from my future. It's a responsibility, so if I hear something, I then feel that I have to act on it. So I can't open myself and think, oh, I'm going to listen to stones and then just walk away and do nothing. Um, which is why I get quite grumpy about it sometimes, because I'll hear things and I'm like, you can't be serious, I really have to go and do that. He was so good at listening, once he heard wildflower seeds burst open, beginning to grow underground. That's hard to do. He said he was just lucky to have been by himself up there in the canyon after a rain. He said it was the quietest place he'd ever been. And he stayed there long enough to understand the quiet. You know, this friend, again, Michael Dunning, was contacted or kind of provoked or communicated with by this yew tree in Scotland, um, which began a process of him kind of becoming a healer, becoming a medicine man by the teachings that this tree gave him. You know, the fact that a tree initiated Michael is only shocking in a you know, West, modern Western context of, of reality of the world, of what can happen. For most people that have lived in most of the world, for most of history, there'd be nothing striking about that, nothing extraordinary about that. Engaging a, a, a fairly um, practical and visceral level with, with dead animals and taking them off the road and burying them. And so I hadn't really I hadn't really been that involved with flesh and bones in that way. And then digging them up a year later to get the bones to make the kind of more like the installation part pieces. For a year Barry Lopez pulled over whenever he passed a dead creature on the road. Animal, bird, reptile. He picked them up. Sometimes he had to scrape them up and he took them away to be buried and to be honoured. When asked why he bothered, he said, you never know. He said, you never know the ones to whom you offer an apology, to whom you give some form of a burial. We've been exploring lots of ideas around um, how we talk with, how we live with, how we brush up against how we interact with things that are not part of the human domain.
I read Crow when I was 19 and I hadn't really read any poetry on purpose and actually didn't really read any other poetry on purpose for some years afterwards. I think the use of the word contagious in relation to this talk is just me doing something quite kind of uh, basic, which is taking Timothy Morton's idea of the ecological thought as an autonomous infection within our thinking and being, rather than a kind of deliberate position, and just taking his very, I love his playful language, and, and plugging it into Crow and seeing, seeing what happens. Imagine a language spoken by all of life's creatures. Imagine saying hello to a hedgehog. Imagine asking how are you to a turtle. You'll have to speak up a bit. Our rising and ears aren't so good. My name is Dr. Ro Dentier, PhD in Neuroscience. And five years ago, I was conducting an investigation that would change my life. If it completely metamorphoses, if, if the metamorphosis is literal, then the, there's no point to the story because it's, it's gone. <laughs> if somebody becomes a pig, they can't write a story. But there was a tension between the metamorphosis, between the human and what it, it was turning into. There was a point which was really quite productive in terms of thinking about this slipperiness between humans and other beings. Skin dancing is themed entirely around human animal, non-human animal metamorphosis. Birch bark, tongue in me, crossbills, beaking pine seeds, tweakily from cones, brown smelling rowan, barely with otterness, ear twitch to a cracklish sound, worker ants nest bounding. All such a gorgeous, not even the flies round my side head eyes can undear me now. I don't know if you becomes dear, but that there's definitely a lot of knowledge and um, understanding of their behaviour, dialogue that's going on between him and the deer and a, a looping and circling around them through his daily patterns, concealing his own scent, his own human identity to try and get closer to them. But then ultimately, if given the chance, he would kill them. You know, cultures around the world and peoples around the world um, have observed animals in creating movement, entire art forms. For example, the martial arts um, form of Kung Fu in China is based on all these different animal movements. Um, the one that I was studying was the praying mantis form, which observed the praying mantis in the way that it um, catches its prey. Uh, the curb stones and when I research them, <clears throat> archaeologists don't call them call it language, which I think is a cultural misperception <laughs> of what language is. I guess I'll respond in the way that I responded to that stone and those etchings. Is I went to them, uh, and my practice was uh, to use the Zen term beginner's mind. I don't know what these mean. I'm just going to respond to them with the shape. So I interpret them through movement and repeated them and through movement. When we remember, we're not necessarily just um, remembering with our minds. That we have muscle memories. We have things which are encoded in our um, physical structure, which is um, an embodied memory. Um, and he's not talking about running, but I think you'll get the, the feeling. By the time one has scrambled over hedges, leapt across boggy streams in deep woods, traversed narrow green lanes all but blocked with brambles, not to mention walked along high airy ridges on a day of tumultuous blue and white skies with magnificent views of deep country all round. By the time one has done this, armed with a copy of a Saxon charter and the two and a half inch maps, the topography of some few miles of the English landscape is indelibly printed on the mind and heart. Our understanding of what it is to be human and human not being this sort of isolated, discrete entity that's unique. There are many things that are isolated and discrete and unique as well as there being a multiplicity of kind of relationships. Organic life is meaning making, you know, the world is full 
of all organisms are making meanings and having purposes and all the things that biologists are told can't possibly be true. It feels like we've had a few hundred years of the kind of whole Cartesian the sort of mind-body separation, the whole idea that animals are actually just these sort of mechanical beings that have no soul or heart. I don't think we've lost anything. Um, because if we think of it like that, it means that the human beings kind of owned it or took possession of it in the first place because you can't lose something that isn't yours. It is an important part of our whole lives. It's an important part of being um, anything other than a, a sort of mechanistic being um, who's just a robot in effect. It's, it's about what makes our lives rich, about recognising um, that there are other forces and other realities that kind of minimises our role in the world in a way that humans are not very good at.